Hey everyone, my name is Jacob and I'm one of the Docker captains and I'm also the creator of a tool called Mutagen, which you might remember from its brief inclusion in Docker Desktop last year as a experimental caching mechanism. Um, but in general, what it does is file synchronization for development work. And Docker is one of the platforms that it supports. Uh, so over the last few years, I've had a lot of discussions with Docker users about container file systems and their performance. And I've seen a lot of cool ideas, but I've also seen a lot of frustration that I think kind of just grows out of either misunderstanding or maybe miscalibrated expectations. So what I wanted to talk about today uh, was container file systems in particular, kind of give an overview of the landscape there uh, and what the different options are, what their uses are, and what their performance characteristics look like, and then kind of talk about how you can make decisions about which parts of your uh, workflow or your project should use uh, which file systems and, and you know, for what purpose. So the short version of this talk basically is that container file systems aren't magic. And I mean that in two different ways. First, I mean, they're not so complex that you can't understand them. Um, they're actually fairly uh, simple and, and most of the complexity there is essential to support uh, the container abstraction, but it's just easier to have it explained in general than to have to delve through documentation and old GitHub issues and stuff like that. Um, the second way that I mean that is that they're not infinitely performant. Uh, so you can't just take a bind mount, for example, and expect that to solve all of your use cases with uh, development work. So it's really important to understand the entirety of that landscape, what the roles of all those file systems are, and how you can leverage them for the best performance uh, with your project. Uh, so we'll start with the core concepts, uh, which are you know containers and the relevant file systems that we're going to deal with. Uh, so just taking it really far back for a sec, what are containers? Um, so obviously they're a portability and isolation mechanism, but really concretely they're just kind of a collection of lower level isolation mechanisms from the Linux kernel. Um, in particular, stuff like cgroups that controls uh, me uh, memory and CPU usage, um, and then uh, what are called namespaces, uh, which create isolated views of different OS uh, resources. So you have like network uh, namespaces, IPC namespaces, um, and the one that we're going to be looking at today is called a mount namespace. And that controls the uh, file systems that are available to a process. Um, and you, know, you can mount multiple file systems within a mount namespace. Uh, and that's you know, exactly what's done in order to support the different abstractions used with containers. Um, in particular, there's sort of five categories of storage we're going to look at. So there's images, container root file systems, bind mounts, volumes, and then uh, temporary file systems. And you really should try to understand and leverage all of these file systems as appropriate. Um, it's kind of the same way that you have you know, a hard drive in your computer, you have thumb drives, you have cloud storage. You know, each of these things serves sort of a different role in your computing experience, and it's the same thing here. The only thing here I would say is maybe temporary file systems are not going to have a huge amount of applicability for development work, um, but you know, it's still important to understand that they exist in case you need to reach for something like that. Uh, so the first thing is images, of course. Um, these are probably the most visible aspect of container file systems. Uh, they're just snapshots of uh, a container root file system with associated metadata like entry point information. And they're built and, dis and distributed in a layered fashion, like you can see on the right here. Each layer is derived from a base image, and then it contains only the uh, deltified changes relative to that base image. So like file changes or deletions or uh, creations, that sort of thing. And each of these layers is stored and distributed as a tarball, like a tar GZ file that you would have source code in. And uh, it's a standardized format. Um, but why we're interested in it is because it's a really excellent storage location for tools that you're going to use, um, and maybe some dependencies like standard libraries or really static dependencies that you're, you know, maybe just your team uses. Uh, so you build images locally to, to store that, um, that, uh, or those files in the images. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is container root file systems. And these are just uh, layered images that have been converted into a you know, real mountable kernel level file system. And there's a couple different mechanisms for doing this. OverlayFS is the one that Docker Desktop uses. There's other mechanisms that, that perform a similar purpose. Um, but OverlayFS is totally fine for most use cases. And um, it's you know, what the default in Docker Desktop is. 
Uh, and one of the roles of these storage drivers is to be able to generate new image layers from, or well, to track changes and then be able to generate new image layers uh, from the changes that occur. So that's actually how image building works, is that you create a temporary container with the root file system set to the base image. You perform whatever changes you need to that by doing commands, and then you snapshot that and create a new image layer. Um, so yeah, there's sort of a duality between uh, container root file systems and images. Um, that supports this really efficient method of distributing container images. And they're mutable, but they're not persistent. Uh, so they have pretty good performance, and, and it's certainly reasonable for most tasks, but they're not, they don't live past the end of the container, except you know, in the snapshot case that I just talked about. So in general, they're you know, good for simple tasks, probably not good for uh, generating large you know, build products or things that you uh, want to persist after the container exits. Um, next up is bind mounts. Uh, these are just a Linux feature. They're not something container specific to make a file system location like a directory uh, accessible in a different location in the um, like path hierarchy of the file system. So you could, uh, if you had like slash uh, system slash data, you could mount bind mount that to slash data and make it available there. And there's no performance penalty for doing that. It, it's basically just mapped to the same underlying file system storage. And so if you're, one of the nice things you can do is you can do this across uh, mount namespaces. So you can bind mount storage from the container host to the container itself. And there's no performance penalty for doing that natively. If you're talking about a virtual machine like you have with Docker Desktop, you have to use a virtual file system to emulate that functionality. So in Docker for Mac, you have gRPC Fuse that does this. Uh, previously it was OS 10FS or OS XFS, depending on uh, what you prefer. And um, on Windows, the situation is a little bit more complex because on Windows, you can actually um, store files directly within the WSL2 file uh, virtual machine that supports Docker Desktop. So you can actually work uh, with like an Ubuntu distribution and have your files inside that WSL2 virtual machine and then get that native bind mount performance into Docker containers. Um, but you can also just do like something analogous to Mac OS uh, where you would, in this case, bind mount from NTFS to uh, the container, and in that case, uh, there's a file system called 9P that's used to do that. Um, but in general, if you can uh, work within WSL2, that's definitely the way to go on Windows. And bind mounts, in my opinion, are really for code that you need to edit. They are not for mounting a 700 megabyte, 100,000 file dependency tree from your host system into your container. And I think that's something that's kind of lost, or, or maybe, you know, again, this is just my opinion. Um, but I think that's something that's not verbalized often enough. Um, really, they're for code that you need to edit. They're not for doing these massive, um, you know, lot or direct access across uh, VM boundaries for these really large code bases. Um, volumes are very uh, similar to bind mounts. They are persistent, uh, usually quite performance storage um, that's stored outside the container, but then bind mounted into the container. Um, and whatever that storage is, is kind of dependent on the situation, but in Docker Desktop, they're just folders. You can see that here on the right where you have two volumes and then they're just backed by folders within the Docker data directory. Um, there's also other storage backends you can use, like, you know, you probably use network storage in production, um, but you can also use plugins like the SSHFS plugin to get volumes that way. Um, one nice thing about them is they can be attached to multiple containers simultaneously. So they're sort of a sharing mechanism in addition to a persistence mechanism. Um, but the thing about them is they have really good performance characteristics because they're just a native file system within the virtual machine, or in Docker Desktop's case at least. So you have an ext4 file system that you've made available to the container. So it's not virtual other than the fact that it's in a virtual machine, which is going to have really good performance. Um, and you can write to that uh, as if it's you know, any other file system accessible to the container. So in production, you typically store data in volumes um, to persist it after the container dies. But I think they actually make a really good uh, place for storing code, especially code that you don't need to edit, uh, like really large dependencies that are approximately static or that you can at least install um, to the volume from inside the container as part of your container startup or something like that. Uh, and then finally, we have temporary file systems. Uh, you know, these are the standard Linux tempfs file systems, just uh, bind mounted into the container. Um, the performance is pretty good since it's in memory, but I don't really see. You know, if you're not using these outside of containers, there's probably not a use case for you uh, immediately within a container. 
Um, they're good for maybe um, sensitive files that you don't want to persist to disk, but if you're not using them for development now, then it's probably not something to, uh, to add to your workflow, uh, at least in the short term. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the container file system landscape. Let's talk specifically now, though, about uh, development tools and how they interact with those file systems. Uh, so development tools in general are probably the most demanding thing that you can run on your computer. They're very different than uh, like a browser or a photo editor um, or even something you'd run in production like a server because they're just constantly relocating or reloading source code files from disk and then they're constantly scanning over the disk. So it's a lot of file system traversal and uh, file system reads. And basically what you see is linear behavior in terms of the number of source code files you have um, and you have many, many system calls that are run that access the data off of the file system. So you have get dns for listing directories, stat for grabbing file and directory metadata, and then you know open, read, and close for actually reading files off a of disk. Fortunately, uh, developer tools don't tend to be too write heavy, so that's not really a problem. Um, but you know it it would be as well if if it scaled in the same way. And these really don't tend to behave you know historically well on virtual file systems, or at least not as well as they do for real file systems. Um, and when you get to you know, modern dependency directories where they're like 100,000 files, uh, it can be a real pain for uh, virtual file systems. And I mean, it can be a pain for real file systems as well, but you know, you're basically uh, starting that battle with one arm tied behind your back if you're, if you're trying to use a file system that's not designed to, to really, you know, not designed for that purpose. It's designed for editability and not for you know, bulk storage. Um, of course, developer tools are also really brutal in terms of CPU and memory usage, but that's kind of outside the scope of this talk. Um, but yeah, they're really tough on your computer. So how should we approach file system performance from a development perspective? I would say if things are fast enough, just leave them because there's no point in prematurely optimizing. Um, but what you should do if you have some sort of performance issue with your tools is try to understand exactly what's actually happening under the hood uh, in terms of you know low-level system calls or maybe doing profiling or something like that if you have the option to do that and really understand how they're hitting the, the file system and if the file system is actually the, the bottleneck. Um, and then perform comparative benchmarks of relevant operations on you know perhaps alternative file systems that you want to assess in terms of performance. So you know if you see something that's really uh, you know read dir heavy, you know maybe you can test the read dir performance on alternative file systems. And, and then get some idea of, of how much gain you might be able to get from that. Um, so how do we actually do that? Um, first of all, you need to understand which file systems are actually being used. Uh, and sometimes it seems like that should be an obvious thing, but you know it's easy to lose track if you have a lot of bind mounts going on or a lot of volumes. So you're gonna wanna drop into a shell inside a container, which you can do uh, with the commands here, like docker exec or docker compose exec. Uh, you just start up a, a postex born shell and then to list the file systems that are currently mounted in the, the mount namespace of the container, uh, you just do df capital T and it will print out the file systems that are in use. So here, for example, we have the root file system, which is overlay FS based. We have a bind mount that's gRPC fuse based at slash code. And we have a volume, which is a genuine ext4 file system that's mounted at slash data. Um, the next step would be sort of timing operations at a high level. And this probably isn't gonna give you a whole lot of information, but it will give you kind of a baseline for what sort of gains you might be able to expect uh, when you combine it with the more detailed uh, data that we're gonna get in the next few steps. Um, so what you really wanna do is understand what your tools are actually doing in terms of system calls. And the way to do that is with a tool called strace. And there's other ways as well, but this is probably the easiest and, and uh, most clear way to do it. So we're using that here to run the get status command uh, we're using it with the F flag to track child processes and the C flag to print a summary. And you'll see here you get a, a summary table of all the system calls that are invoked by that command. Um, and you'll see that they kind of correspond to what you'd expect, right? You'd expect it to be doing a bunch of stat calls to get file information. And you'd expect the number of calls to be roughly equal to the number of files um, that's inside the uh, the Git repository. And that's actually, for this case, that is the case. Um, not everything's going to give you this clean of a trace, especially if it doesn't use, you know, libc or has like a weird runtime or something like that to do with system calls. It's not always going to be this nice, but it's at least a good starting point to see if there's something that's, you know, taking up a huge chunk of the of the, the runtime for a process. 
Um, in this case, you can see that LSTAT 64 is the is the dominant system call, taking up 40 almost 42 percent of the time of the system calls, I should say. Um, and then once you have that information, you can do more detailed tracing. So if you emit the dash C flag for S trace, it will actually uh, print out system calls as they uh, are run. Um, so if you have a good trace like you did in the previous step, um, you could actually grep for a particular system call like we're doing here and understand exactly which files it's hitting. If you don't get such a clean uh, summary trace, what you can do is maybe grep for paths. Like here, I'm grepping for my home directory to see uh, what files are being accessed by the go build command. And this is a really good way to kind of identify unexpected work or maybe unnecessary work um, where maybe some tool is hitting a bunch of dependency code that you weren't expecting and, and you know, kind of see what's actually taking up the most time uh, as these tools are running. And then once you've done that, um, you know, that's where the path kind of diverges in terms of what's, you know, the next few steps. Um, I would say the guiding principle is always to help the computer do less because um, that's always going to be faster. And I, I've kind of pinched that phrase from this article that I've linked to here by Evan Martin, uh, who, uh, I don't know if he still works for Google, but he was the author of the Ninja Build Tool, which was designed for building Google Chrome on Linux, and now it builds a lot of other stuff as well. Um, but the whole philosophy of that tool uh, was really just to make uh, it do the least amount of work that it possibly could to accomplish its goal. And I think with your build tools, you can kind of do that at both a high level in terms of understanding what scripts you actually need to run with you know, every iteration of your coding process, and then um, also at a low level in terms of understanding what those tools are actually doing and seeing if maybe there's something you could strip out. Uh, or even at a lower level in terms of what's the file system that you're using doing. Like if it's going over um, you know, our RPC call outside of a VM, that's going to be more expensive than a native file system. So you know, it's always easier to, uh, to remove work than it is to optimize it. Um, but then you know, after that, you can kind of experiment with alternative file systems, you know, perhaps move dependencies to a volume and understand if they perform differently there. Um, and you can also dig a lot deeper with other tools like eBPF, uh, although that gets a little, you know, really deep uh, benchmarking in that case gets kind of complicated because you have, you know, things like um, CPU scaling and you have uh, de-entry caching and stuff like that that you really have to be aware of and understand exactly what you're comparing when you do these uh, really deep introspections of tools. Um, fortunately, in most cases, the recommendations and, and the conclusions are going to be the same for everybody, which is you want to structure your project in such a way that uh, like the more static elements are in more optimal storage. Um, so I want to just kind of cut through real quick a bunch of uh, um, recommendations that pretty much anyone can use and it's almost certainly going to make their project uh, run a little bit faster. Um, so the first recommendation is kind of a meta recommendation, but that's to just understand what options are available, what their roles are, and uh, you know what kind of performance characteristics they have because there's not a one-size-fits-all solution in the same way that you wouldn't use a USB drive, like a thumb drive, to boot your system on a daily basis and perform you know, off-site backups and stuff like that, right? You have different uh, mechanisms for doing different things. Um, what I would say, though, is that you should uh, use the simplest solution you can that is suitable for your needs. So, you know, there's not a huge difference between something taking 10 milliseconds and it taking 100 milliseconds. So if it's fast enough already, you know, don't, don't worry about micro-optimizing that. Um, if you do need to reach for something more complex, I would always start with built-in solutions like, you know, moving files to a volume or moving them into an image. And I'm saying that as somebody who develops a third-party solution in this space, uh, it's always better to try to use built-in solutions or idiomatic solutions first. And then, as I said earlier, uh, you really just want to help the computer work faster by doing less. So whatever that means for your project, uh, you, should, you should try and do that. One of the easiest ways to do that is just to audit your dependencies. It's super, super easy to pull in you know, tens or hundreds of megabytes of dependencies and you know, thousands of files. This example here is a package.json file with four direct dependencies. And you can see there's you know, 24 megabytes of files and you know, four plus over 4,000 of them, right? So you should really just be cognizant of that. And especially for these static dependencies, uh, there's really no reason to be pushing those over a virtual file system. Um, in fact, in general, you should really avoid crossing the host VM boundary um, for anything. But especially with file systems, all of those system calls I mentioned earlier become RPC calls. So 
if you can statically cache something or dynamically generate it inside the container, just don't cross that, that VM boundary, you're gonna be a lot happier. Um, and really just bind mount only what you need to edit because that's what bind mounts are for in the development scenario. Um, it's not for putting your entire dependency tree in there. Um, and certainly not for something like a standard library that should you know, be part of your images. And if you can do something like uh, work inside the WSL2 VM on Windows, um, that's you know, really an excellent option. Um, there are certain files that you shouldn't uh, bind, mount, bind mount across the boundary of the VM either. This is more of a correctness issue than a performance one, but it's, it's kind of both. So certainly memory mapped files like databases, um, inode sensitive files like the git index. Um, in, you know, in that case, it's okay to include the .git directory as part of your bind mount, but just don't run git operations inside the container that would access those files. Um, Machine specific code, you know, you get a lot of that with native modules inside of uh, dependency trees. So there's A, you know, a lot of expense to synchronizing those and B, no point in doing so because what gets compiled as a native module from Mac OS is not gonna make sense as a native module inside the Linux container. So, you know, don't, don't synchronize machine specific code that you're trying to use inside the container. Um, you know, unless it's something that you've intentionally cross compiled. Uh, definitely don't do huge uh, regularly updating files like logs and then you know standard libraries and dependencies um, obviously have better places that, places that they can go you know depending on the level of staticness they could be potentially in images or in volumes or in container file systems kind of just depends on what's easiest and um, you know how often you need to update those things uh, if you can use file system watching with tools that's great because that kind of takes that linear scaling behavior and makes it uh, you know, a constant time behavior in terms of um, having to reprocess files when they change. Because if a tool knows exactly which files have changed, it doesn't need to rescan or, or reread the entire uh, code base directory hierarchy or hierarchies um, in order to do its rebuild. So definitely leverage that if you can. Uh, not all file systems support event notifications, so you should you know, check that before you, you know, spend a day wondering why it's not rebuilding. But uh, most of them do, and uh, most tools do as well. Um, finally, you can consider synchronization as kind of a last resort. So the idea is to synchronize your code from your host file system into a volume, for example, um, or a container file system. And that will sort of reduce the cost, well, it will reduce the cost of system calls uh, compared to a virtual file system because you're hitting like an ext4 backing file system or, or maybe overlay fs. But it's still not a, a magic bullet or anything like that. Um, you need to keep, you know, the same philosophy in terms of minimal or in minimalism and, uh, you know, not expect that you can synchronize a gig of files and have that work. But if you have a huge code base and you have to edit all of it all the time, this can be an option. Um, you're just basically paying for that re reduction in system call overhead by paying for the transfer time of the files and the storage of those files inside the VM. Um, but that might be an acceptable cost in your case. There's different tools for doing this. They work in different ways, um, so you should definitely experiment with different ones. Mutagen is the one that I work on. There's also Docker Sync, uh, which has uh, been around for quite a while. There's VS Code, which has its remote uh, container extensions. Um, there's projects that you know use sync thing, and they, they're kind of optimized for maybe like a specific framework, or they're like a specific compose setup for doing something with you know, uh, Magento or something like that. So you can look for, for maybe more turnkey solutions than having to wrap this up yourself if you want to go this route. Um, but again, I would you know try and do built-in solutions first. Um, and finally, yeah, just stay up to date. Uh, the Docker desktop release notes are always full of performance improvements and um, new features that you could potentially leverage. There's definitely a lot of GitHub discussions about file system performance with Docker desktop. You know, there's a lot of negativity in there that I don't think is really warranted because there's nobody trying to make file systems slower or anything like that. It's just a really you know complex issue with a lot of facets to it, uh, and there's not going to be a silver bullet that works for everyone. And I can I can pretty much guarantee that, um, from my experience at least. Uh, I don't speak for for Docker, but I think you're always going to have to, you know, expect to do some critical thinking about your project and how it's structured, and um, you know not expect that the computer is just going to get infinitely fast and, and solve all those problems for you. Um, but if you do find a solution that, that works really well, definitely share it in whatever the appropriate forum is, uh, you know, maybe for like a language mailing list or a framework mailing list or something like that, because there's almost certainly somebody else who has had the same performance issue. 
Um, so yeah, in summary, uh, different file systems have different roles and they have different features and different characteristics. You can't just take a bind mount and use that for everything. And you kind of need to really you know, critically think about what you're doing. And you need to understand all the options and, and what's appropriate for, for different scenarios. And in order to understand what's appropriate, you really need to understand what your tools are doing concretely under the hood and um, yeah, try and optimize those to do less work if you can. Um, yeah, beyond that, I think just kind of be kind on the issue tracker and elsewhere and you know, share whatever ideas you can find with your colleagues and you know, other developers working on the same thing. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a great uh, time at DockerCon and feel free to send me any questions or uh, feedback or disagreement or anything like that. I'm happy to discuss. Um, but yeah, otherwise, have a great day. Thanks a lot.